take one more take sorry no, let's, let's go with the blue now. first no this fine okay let, let's start right now and we have rohan with us rohan is one of the coolest smartest guys i know from iit rohan do you like to give an intro <laughs> no no <laughs> Okay, sorry. Okay, so hi, I'm Rohan. I am uh, one of Hari Haran's school friends. Uh, I um, studied at Saint Thomas Residential School, like Hari, uh, until tenth anyway. And uh, then I went to IIT Madras, where I did a B Tech in Engineering Physics, which is basically a four year program. And now I'm currently pursuing an integrated uh, PhD program at Northwestern University in the United States. Oh. So. Um, Yeah, and my PhD program is in physics. So, okay. Damn. All right. So, how did you get interested in physics? So, was it starting from GE itself, or like, when did your interest in physics start developing? So, in eleventh, I had a basic inclination towards science, but I wasn't really sure what I actually I wanted to do, like in engineering or whatever. So, I was a bit clueless. So, I was like, okay, fine, I like science, but I hate biology. So, I'll okay, fine, I'll do engineering. <laughs> So I picked engineering. I started, you know, going for coaching and stuff like that. And uh, a friend of mine called uh, Shamim actually introduced me to a series of books called the Feynman Lectures, yeah. which are uh, some of the most definitive and most uh, comprehensive lectures on physics. They start right from the basics of physics, uh, work power, energy, force, etc., and all the way to uh, quantum mechanics, relativistic uh, dynamics, path integrals, everything. So. um i got started with the feynman lectures thank you shamim and i started liking the way physics was taught in general by feynman then i watched a couple of you know popular science videos on youtube hey this is what einstein said this is what this guy said oh, okay it seems interesting it's cool it's cool i mean i still found the math very hard and intimidating but you know i thought it was something i could do so okay. uh, that is always an option at the back of my head So yeah. once I finished J, once I got my rank, I was like, okay, what are my options here? And luckily for me, uh, engineering physics at IITM was one of them. Damn, that's really cool. What was his J rank? I mean, second uh, top. My, top two thousand something. Yeah. Yeah, it was within the top thousand five hundred, thousand six hundred. My advanced rank was one six seven, one six seven nine, and mains oh. was seven twenty something. Yeah. That's that's. Pretty cool, man. I mean, like that's a really, really cool rank. I mean, you could have gone for other branches and other IITs, but then you wanted physics only, right? I mean, you could have chosen electrical and yeah. IIT or something. I could have gone electrical at some other IITs, but so um, or one of the professors at my coaching institute did say that you know I would be suited for electrical engineering as well, but I was always interested in physics, so I was like, mm, I want to pick something with physics in it also, and of course, IIT Madras is IIT Madras, so. I was like, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll get this here. And engineering physics at IIT Madras is coincidentally, you know, a balance between uh, electrical engineering and physics. It's like fifty percent electrical and fifty percent physics. So it allows you to keep both your options open. So I was like, hey, I'll go for that. So that's what I picked. Wow, that's really cool. And I mean, somehow it is a nice choice. <laughs> yeah, that that's really really cool. I mean, how did your experience at IIT shape you? I mean. Do you do you wanted to go for research when you were in IIT or like before going to college? What was your thought process like? Do you think that okay maybe I'll go for a job or like you wanted to go for masters just before you joined graduation itself? Like how what did what do you think of it? So again, uh, like I mentioned, engineering physics is fifty percent electrical and fifty percent physics. So if you go towards physics, you have to do a masters, you have to do a PhD because otherwise you can't do research in physics. You need to study. Like deep into the subject and you know get qualified for research or whatever. So I could either go towards that or electrical engineering, which you know would let me get a job, would allow me to go for masters, whatever. So I had all those options available heading in, and it was important for me that I had those options because I was really scared of research. I was like, mm. "Fuck, I have to do a PhD, five years, six years, whatever, maybe ten years, who knows?" And yeah, it was really <laughs> scary for me. I was like. Dude, I'm just 18 and I can't commit to PhD or whatever shit. So yeah. I was like, no, I need to keep my options open. So I was like, maybe I'll figure it out as time goes. So I went to IIT and then, ah, uh, so I was still keeping my options open, but somehow along the way, I picked physics projects. I picked physics. I mean, I like the physics courses. So I just ended up here. So yeah, yeah I was like, I didn't really think of it along the way. It just sort of happened. But yeah, IITM played a huge, huge role in shaping me because, 
you're there with people so smart, like people who are like way smarter than me and to like seeing them work, seeing them think. It sort of motivates you to work harder and be smarter. It's just an amazing environment. Of course, there are bad elements too, but I'm saying <laughs> it does really push yeah. you to be better. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, bad elements as in, you know, you have a toxic competition. Like The competition gets toxic sometimes. And mm. you, of course, have weed, you have everything. Like, mm. there is too much freedom, so that's also there. Yeah. But... We, just, we just cut it this part on... out. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it depends on who you, you know, uh, who you keep your circle to and stuff like that. Makes sense. Luckily, I found really great people there. That's amazing, man. So, I mean, so how, so if a person, like, let's say in second year or third year, he's planning on doing his master's or his PhD, what is the process like? Like, how do you start applying to universities? What kind of LOAs do you need? And how do you even just go along the process? Like, just let's imagine that I'm in my second year. Let's say I'm planning, I have thoughts of doing a PhD or master's. So, like, how do you proceed forward in that direction? Okay, so uh, first of all, both master's and PhD, the process is radically different. So for master's, uh, say you're in your second year, you would have to get uh, three letters of recommendation. And those need not necessarily be from, you know, project professors or whatever. You can have course professors, like people who have taught you and stuff like that. Because as a master's student, you're expected to be a student. So your learning capabilities are first and foremost, what should be important, like highlighted. So say you have three letters of recommendation, which is for the United States. I think a few places in Europe have two. I'm not sure, but yeah, say two or three. So you should have, you can have one or two uh, recommendations from course professors. Maybe one recommendation from an industry, you know, a person you worked with in industry, and one from a professor you worked with. So you can get those letters of recommendation. And again, like to get those letters of recommendation, you have to obviously work with them and you know impress mm. them, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, then uh, for master's, of course, your GPA matters a lot more. All right. So you'll have to focus on that. I'm not really sure how much the cutoff is for various places. Like, there's no formal cutoff, but like informally, you need to get this much and you get this much, whatever. Yeah. So I'm not really sure how that works, but there is there are certain measures and stuff. You can look them up. Mm-hmm. Um, asking seniors, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But for a PhD, stuff is actually radically different because you have to show that you're proficient at research or that you can do research or you can think in a manner that is conducive for research. So first and foremost, you again need three letters of recommendation, but out of three, you should be able to get two or maybe even three from professors you've worked with. All right. And here industry recommendations are not the norm. Like you need recommendations from professors. And uh, generally, so the way this works is unfortunately, the I mean, letters of recommendations from people that they know will be valued a lot more. This mm. is particularly true for Europe because mm. uh, in Europe, you apply to the professors when you apply for a PhD. Mm-hmm. So when you apply for a PhD to a professor in Europe, and the professor considers you you know, eligible for employment or not. So the professor has the final say. Mm. So if the professor wants you, he can pick, he or she can pick you or discard you. And ultimately it's under the professor's jurisdiction. So obviously if the professor knows someone and you have that person's letter of recommendation, it'll be much more valuable. Okay. Connections matter a lot. Yeah. Whereas for the United States, you come under the committee. There is a department committee and you come under that. So if the committee recommend, I mean, committee thinks you're good enough, you get in. Okay. But even then I have heard and I sort of experienced that, you know, if you work with more connected profs, more established professors, all that stuff matters a lot more. Like it helps you a lot. Got it. So yeah. So but just letter. Oh, but of course, GPA matters for PhD too. But I would say not so much because even if you have a comparatively lower GPA, you can offset it with research experience. Got it. Got it. So the kind of professors that you work with, they matter a lot. I mean, so like you have to work with selected high profile professors if you want to go for a master. So like. Or, or PhD? Or... No, not for masters. For PhD, yeah. I wouldn't say high professors. Like, of course, the work you do matters first and foremost. That is number one. Mm. The work you do is number one, the most important thing. So it doesn't really matter who you work with. The work is number one, the most important thing. Number two, of course, if you're doing anyway good work, then, you know, pick certain professors who are more well-known in their fields, mm. certain professors. 
like for example, if I want to apply to Professor X at uh, some university in the United States, if I have a letter of recommendation that is written by Professor Y, who has worked with Professor X, mm. then I would have a greater chance of getting in. All right. Makes so sense. I didn't really think of all this while applying, like while choosing my interns, because back then you're just, you know, I want to find an intern, I want to find yeah. a professor to work with and stuff like that. Yeah. So you won't really think of this. But if you have got multiple offers, then you can weigh them by yeah. you know, which professor is more established, etc. Yeah, makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. And... But of course, first and foremost, it's your work that matters. So don't really worry about professor's hype or whatever too much. Okay, that that's perfect. So like you work with professors in India. Have you worked with professors abroad? I mean, you just went there, I guess. I mean, have so you? So I worked with a professor from Germany uh, called David Vincenzo. Okay. He was pretty established in my field. Uh, he's considered to be the father of modern quantum computing or whatever. What? But 